Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we covered a Malgasy diplomatic tour around Britain and the USA, in an ultimately vain effort to drum up foreign support against the impending French invasion. While they earned some public sympathy, though, the tour ultimately failed to win diplomatic commitments. In their fight for their independence, Madagascar was alone. Season 4, Episode 27. Independence Mostly Defended. In May of 1883, cannon fire rang across the western coast of Madagascar. French warships bombarded a series of Malgasy forts guarding the largest western port, Mahajanga. The French then bombarded the city itself, destroying its coastal defenses and landing an amphibious invasion. The admiral of the French fleet delivered a final official ultimatum to the Malgasy government. They demanded that the Malgasy overturn Law 85, recognize French sovereignty over the northern portion of the island, and pay a crippling 1 million franc indemnity. The 55-year-old Empress Rana Faluna II, though, stood firm. She had been suffering from a severe chronic sickness for weeks, but nonetheless found the strength to deliver a speech from Marufa. Quote, If this land which God has given to me, and where my ancestors rest, and where the bones of your ancestors lie, buried, is claimed by others, then I stand up for the benefits which God has conferred. God made me a woman. Still, when anyone attempts to seize that which he has given me, and the country which my ancestors conquered is threatened, then I feel strong to go forth as your leader, for I should feel ashamed if I did not protect what God had entrusted to me. The French war against Madagascar had begun. The French navy subsequently wheeled around to the east coast and opened a second front, bombarding and capturing Thomasina a few days later. In the city, they ransacked local homes and firms for supplies, targeting British-owned investments with special malice. A total of 10,000 French soldiers now occupied Malgasy ports and were threatening to push into the interior. The French leadership were confident that this war would be a quick victory, and they had good reason to be. Their last campaign in Africa, the invasion of Tunisia just two years prior, had been an unrelenting success, with the French defeating their North African foes and occupying the country in a matter of just two weeks, and crushing a following insurgency in a handful of months later. Surely, if the relatively civilized, light-skinned North Africans could be conquered with such ease, then the dark-skinned Malgasy must crumble in an even more dramatic fashion. However, this French fantasy began to struggle with the reality of the situation they were in. When the French expeditionary force tried to push in from their coastal positions in Madagascar, they found resistance to be far more rigid than they had expected. While the French held an uncontestable advantage at sea and at the coast, since their ships could hail down cannon fire on any Marina forces who tried to mount a defense against French positions, it turned out that when this major advantage was nullified, that the French struggled to make any inroads into the countryside. Stuck on the outskirts of Tuamasina and Mahajanga, the French attempted a few reconnaissance missions to see if the Malgasy lines around them were weak enough to break at any point, and were disappointed when these recon missions came back with the news that, no, the French did not have the firepower to break through Malgasy interior positions. So, a stalemate ensued. The French held most major Malgasy ports as well as the surrounding territory, but were unable to push any further. Meanwhile, on the Malgasy side of the war, a new central figure would emerge to defend Malgasy sovereignty. And who exactly he was might surprise you. The man who would become the central figure in the Malgasy war to protect their sovereignty was a British mercenary in Malgasy employ called Digby Willoughby. Willoughby had a long track record of warfare in southern Africa. In 1883, He had fought extensively for the British in their various colonial wars in South Africa, including the famous Anglo-Zulu War and the Basuto Gun War. As a soldier of fortune, though, Willoughby's economic prospects started to worsen as South Africa entered a brief lull in colonial conflicts in 1883. As the conflict between France and Madagascar happened to be heating up at the same time, though, Willoughby spotted an opportunity. While at first he simply traveled to Madagascar to make a quick buck as a mercenary, he soon began to develop a genuine passion for the idea of protecting Malgasy independence. Now, Willoughby's newfound passion wasn't really rooted in a love for Malgasy culture or sovereignty, 
but rather mostly out of disdain for France's naked and unjustifiable imperialist conquest. Hollywood execs, if you're listening and have been looking for a last samurai-type movie but set in Africa, write this one down. Willoughby ended up becoming a pretty big deal in the Malagasy army. He himself would claim that Raini Lajarifoni even promoted him to basically second in command of the whole army. This is probably an exaggeration, but Willoughby did certainly act as a high-ranking officer and military advisor to the Malagasy prime minister. His main value to the Malagasy military would come not in the form of his tactical skills, but rather in his close relationship with arms smugglers. Despite a French blockade, Willoughby managed to regularly smuggle major shipments of arms and ammunition to Madagascar, acting as a key logistical pipeline for the army. As the stalemate at Madagascar's ports continued, a horrific surprise occurred in the palace at Antanarifu. Queen Rana Faluna II had been struggling with illness even prior to the French invasion, and the stress of managing her empire during wartime was only exacerbating her symptoms. In November of 1883, these symptoms grew too severe, and Rana Faluna passed away. Now, the death of Rana Faluna herself actually had surprisingly little effect on the course of the war with France. While she was a potent icon, a strong symbol of national unity, and a good source of morale for her soldiers, Rana Faluna, throughout her rule, had delegated basically all duties of state to Raini Lairifuni, who was still very much alive. On the other hand, her status as an incredibly popular figure meant that the death of Rana Faluna did threaten to seriously harm the morale of the soldiers in the field. To prevent a feared collapse in morale, Raini Lairifuni had to rush to find a new, equally beloved figure with undeniable royal pedigree, and elevate her to the monarchy at the first opportunity. With the clock ticking, Raini Lairifuni hastily found his candidate, a royal princess with direct descent from the original Radama I himself. Likely in an intentional effort to obfuscate the queen's death, and to at least temporarily spread the impression that Rana Faluna II was still alive, Raini Lairifuni urged this princess to adopt a new throne name, also Rana Faluna. Literally on the same day as the death of the previous queen, a coronation was hastily and haphazardly arranged in Tanarifu, with Rana Faluna III being crowned in front of few onlookers. Okay, so a little about Rana Faluna III so we can get to know her a little better going forward. She was born in 1861. Now, she was the daughter of Raketaka. Remember her? Well, it's okay if you don't because we're going quite a bit back in time here. Raketaka had been the daughter of Radama I, and had even been the old king's favorite to succeed him as his heir following his death. Of course, it didn't turn out that way, and Radama's oldest wife, the first Rana Faluna, seized power with a military coup. Crucially, you might remember the detail that Raketaka, who was only a small child at the time, was the only member of Radama's immediate family who was intentionally spared from Rana Faluna's royal purge. And see, it all comes back around. It's probably not a coincidence that Raketaka waited to have her child just as Rana Faluna I was starting to fail in health, as birthing a child with a strong rival claim to the throne was a very dangerous idea. Now, the young royal princess, the future Rana Faluna III, grew up in a manner that was pretty typical for an elite woman of her period. She lived in comfort on her family's estate and eventually married a wealthy Andriana man. They remained married until exactly 1883. Just as Rana Faluna II was showing her own signs of illness, so too did the future Rana Faluna III's husband. He became mysteriously sick and passed away just a couple months before the queen, leaving the princess available to marry someone new, such as, I don't know, maybe the prime minister? The sheer convenience of her husband's death has led to pretty widespread speculation that Rana Faluna III may have risen to power by poisoning her husband. And some more fringe theories even claim that she might have poisoned the Queen Rana Faluna II as well. In both of these cases, the evidence is entirely circumstantial though, and there's really nothing to back this up beyond rumors. The main concern surrounding Rana Faluna III's rise was the fear of declining military morale. While their similar nomenclature, by design, would create confusion around the news of the old queen's demise, it was only a matter of time until the truth of Rana Faluna II's passing became widely known among the soldiery. Apart from the coronation of a new queen, Raini Lairifuni had other potential challenges to worry about with his war effort. The reforms he had implemented earlier in his career 
had made Madagascar increasingly open to and dependent on the global market. So France's embargo on Madagascar was taking a serious toll on the country's economy. The Prime Minister figured that the longer the war went on in this position, that the French would only gain more leverage in future negotiations. At least in this moment, the failure of the French hope for a quick and easy invasion of Madagascar, and the ongoing stalemates at Madagascar's two major ports, would allow him at least a modicum of bargaining power at the negotiating table. So, the Prime Minister sent a messenger out of Antananarifu to negotiate a compromise with the French and end the war. In the last days of November 1883, a messenger arrived in Tuomasina to negotiate peace with the French. The messenger agreed to compensate the French for the dispute over Laborde's estate with an indemnity of 40,000 pounds, the equivalent of 8 million modern American dollars. They also pledged to loosen restrictions on foreign property and to further negotiate the questions of Malagasy property law in future summits with France. As it stood, this concession was still a pretty big loss for Madagascar. That indemnity they proposed was fairly crushing for a government in serious financial trouble already, However, it was clear that this was a price that Aini Lairifuni was willing to pay for the key issue at hand, the preservation of Merina sovereignty. The peace offer refused to rescind Merina sovereignty over northwest Madagascar, and furthermore refused a demand which was becoming increasingly central to French negotiations, that Madagascar surrendered its ability to conduct independent foreign policy and become a French protectorate. But despite the pretty generous Malagasy offer of peace, the French army rejected it, and instead maintained their plans for an attack. By now, the de facto goal of the invasion had become clear, to subjugate not only northern Madagascar, but the entire island as a French colony. So, the peace offer was refused, as the French, despite these early roadblocks, were still confident in their coming victory. Now, we're going to take a brief pause before coming back to the history, so we can get a word from this episode's sponsors. However, while the military situation on the ground was devolving into a stalemate, the French politicians who had encouraged the war were becoming increasingly desperate for a victory. Political support for the war effort was becoming increasingly difficult in metropolitan France and was soon about to reach an all-time low. See, in addition to this war in Madagascar, the French had simultaneously landed themselves in an even costlier quagmire across the world in Southeast Asia. France had already fought a series of wars in Vietnam, which, while successfully advancing French control of the region, did so at a high cost. To make matters worse, French colonial claims in Southeast Asia often overlap with Chinese territorial and business ambitions, meaning that French colonial ambitions in Southeast Asia could easily transform into an outright war with the Qing dynasty of China. Regarding both Southeast Asia and Madagascar, the French public's confidence in these wars was shrinking by the day. In fact, when Raini Lairifuni had sent an ambassador to offer peace, the French military was terrified that the civilian government would accept the offer. So, in violation of French law, they organized a cover-up, suppressing any news that an offer for peace had been put on the table. The army also began heavily censoring journalists covering the war. So if you're wondering why we don't have the same level of detail in this conflict compared to, say, the Anglo-Ashanti Wars from last season, uh, that's why. However, the French military was also aware that this status of secrecy could not last forever. It was only a matter of time till the civilian government found out how little progress they'd made in Madagascar. So, they made a desperate move, and mobilized for a risky attack on Malagasy positions. Raini Lahirifuni, eager to counter the attack that the French were mobilizing for, sent reinforcements commanded by Willoughby to Malagasy positions outside of Tuamasina. The Prime Minister couldn't be sure of exactly where the French would attack, so he sent reinforcements to multiple forts in the area. Ultimately, the French chose the location of what would be the climactic battle of the conflict at a small village outside of Tomasina called Isamehafie. Each side had their respective advantages. The Malgasi were dug in and numbered approximately 4,000 defenders, compared to only 3,000 French. Behind their fortifications, meanwhile, they were supported by strong artillery batteries. The French, however, possessed a division containing mounted cavalry, advanced artillery, and a group of men with machine guns. The French commander ordered his troops to perform a head-on assault at Malgasi positions, hoping that a heavy artillery barrage and machine gun fire before the advance could catch the Malgasi defenders off guard and force them into a rout. 
However, this strategy relied on underestimating the discipline of the Duggan Malgasi. Ultimately, the artillery and machine gun fire did little to spook them, and they remained in their Duggan positions. So, instead of attacking fleeing enemies as he had hoped, the French commander instead sent his troops headfirst into well-fortified Malgasi defenses. Before they had even gotten close to the forts, they had already taken significant losses and broke out into a rout. Unfortunately for the Malagasy defenders, though, they had used up so much ammunition in defending their fort that they had none left over for an advance. So the stalemate continued. The French had failed to break through the Malagasy defenses, while the Malagasy defenders had failed to inflict fatal casualties on the French attackers. After a few other similar failed attacks in the Tuamasina front, the French ultimately tried to shift to a new strategy. In the north, French soldiers started to make amphibious landings near Sakalava settlements, in an effort to persuade the Sakalava to launch a rebellion against their marina overlords and providing them arms for when they did. Given the widespread resentment against Hofa rule, the pitch was easy to make, and several Sakalava villages went into an uprising against the marina. The marina, on the other hand, had began a campaign of nipping these rebellions in the bud, heavily punishing towns which were suspected of harboring rebels or supporting the French war effort in any ways. One of these towns, Jiangua, was even burnt to the ground by Marina soldiers on the suspicion that one of its residents was aiding the French, which, in fairness, they probably were. The Sakalava of the region surrounding Jiangua were outraged by the attack on what was mostly a civilian target, and with several hundred Sakalava supporters and 250 French regulars armed with machine guns, they launched a punitive attack. Their target was a nearby Merina civilian settlement, one which they would destroy with equal brutality to what the Merina had inflicted on them. However, before they could reach the Merina settlement, the joint Sakalava and French army was ambushed by a group of Merina soldiers. Despite numbering only 400 men and being inferior both in numbers and quality of armament, the Merina managed to catch the French and Sakalava off guard and routed them. The embarrassing defeat outside of Jiangoa marked the beginning of the end of the French campaign in the Sakalava country, as most French soldiers were withdrawn from the region shortly after. Ultimately, the French army would mount only two further offensives, one of which in the south resulted in little to no gains, while the other in the north resulted in some modest victories. But with the stalemate with the Malgasi unending, and their leverage only potentially getting worse, the French opted to meet at the negotiating table. But despite the recent setbacks, the French still did hold the commanding position in the coming peace treaty. While the French could barely push beyond Tuamasina and Mahajanga, the Malgasi army could similarly not make the effort to push them out. Meanwhile, the Malgasi economy was on the brink of collapse, with the French occupation of their ports and blockade of the seas making it nearly impossible to export raw materials to the global market. So, regardless of how each army had fared in battle, Raini Lairifuni and Willoughby went to the negotiating table with the French, prepared to make concessions. The French military actually again tried to refuse and hide the peace offer, but this time the French civilian government discovered the reality of what was going on. For their insubordination, Baudet and the French admiral commanding the expedition were both recalled, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs taking their place. As more information leaked out about the Madagascar campaign and its struggles, as well as the growing cost of the war in Vietnam, which had, as the French had feared, expanded into a war against China more generally, the French government was consumed by scandal. Due in large part to these unpopular wars, Jules Ferry was abruptly and ceremoniously chased out of office. The new French negotiators proved a little more conciliatory than the unmovable Baudet, but still pursued French expansionist goals in the region. As expected, the first French offer of peace involved French sovereignty over the Sakalave and the protectorate over the Merina. These terms were absurd and shot down immediately by Raini Lairifuni. After a lengthy discussion, a compromise was reached. The French agreed to recognize Malgasi sovereignty over the Sakalave and the rest of northern Madagascar, with the exception of a small harbor town called Diego Suarez which would become a French protectorate. Now, the French did include a section which claimed that the French representative would have veto power over Malgasi foreign policy, which seemed like the protectorate status that Raini Lairifoni desperately wanted to avoid. However, in an addendum to the treaty, the French representative further defined what this meant, 
and that Madagascar would be able to enter into defensive and commercial agreements without hindrance, but that the country could not cede its own territory or become the protectorate of another foreign power without French consent. Additionally, it meant that France was responsible for escorting Malagasy diplomats during foreign ventures. Finally, the Malagasy agreed to pay a fine of 400,000 francs to the French, in exchange for the French dropping all previous claims of debts and indemnities owed, which, in the end, actually saved the Malagasy government money, while the French also agreed to make a large low-interest loan to ease the Malagasy government in rebuilding after the war. This treaty, while it seemed one-sided, was actually an indecisive document when accompanied with the addendums clarifying its meaning. On the one hand, the Malagasy had made several meaningful concessions, especially the ownership over Diego Suarez and the erosion of a few elements of Malagasy sovereignty. However, it also contained some French concessions to the Malagasy, such as finally dropping the long-held claims over northern Madagascar and forgiving previous indemnity claims. It had also, more importantly, proven that Madagascar would not be the easy target for conquest that Jules Ferry had hoped it would be. And all of this would have been true, except for a sneaky act of diplomatic subterfuge on the part of the French ambassadors. See, when the negotiators returned to France, they didn't want the public finding out that the French government had made concessions along with gains in the Malgasy conflict. So they strategically decided to leave all copies of the addendum in Madagascar, and return to Paris without it. Signed by Queen Rana Felona III and Raini Lairifumi, claimed that Madagascar was now a French protectorate, without the crucial asterisk of what the Malagasy government had clarified that as meaning. It's not clear who was personally responsible for the exclusion of the addendum. For what it's worth, Willoughby himself claimed that the French admiral, who had been the architect of the war in Madagascar, had removed the section in an attempt to save face over his own military failures. But the selectively publicized treaty had a marked effect on future french Malagasy relations. Now, I want to stress that this bit of diplomatic deception didn't work. The French, British, and all other European governments were quickly alerted by the Malgasi government of the missing addendum. As a result, every European country except France refused to recognize the immensely illegitimate claims of French protectorate status, at least not at this time. While France would later leverage this treaty in future efforts to further colonize Madagascar, Reality on the ground in Madagascar did not, and never would, resemble the protectorate that their incomplete treaty claimed it was. But while the war had been inconclusive in the negotiating room, it had a devastating effect on the Marina economy. Years of lost income from the blockade, damage to the two most significant maritime ports in Madagascar, and the expensive process of raising and then decommissioning an army had wreaked havoc on the state's finances while the Prime Minister's economic plans had fallen entirely to the wayside. With Madagascar returning to peace in 1886, the Prime Minister was now in desperate straits. He would end up making one final Hail Mary attempt to transform Madagascar into an industrial economy capable of competing on the global market. Meanwhile, as you might expect, the French are not going to give up their coveted control over Madagascar so easily. Join us in our next episode, as while Raini Lairi Funi initiates the final phase of Malagasy industrialization, France prepares for the fatal strike on Malagasy independence. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like our show, then we would greatly appreciate if you could help support the show and our project of freely available online history education. You can do this by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, or by sharing the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy learning about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Dimitri, Alexander Travis, BB Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Sebelavie, Pascal Ngococha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwabodike, Sheuna Laurentimaim, Kwajo Mankwa, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, Samuel Badu, Vincent Virgiani, Niti, Kitty, Tariq Beetleman, and Calvin J. Norris, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really, really means a lot.